Tonight's conversation will focus on Charles White, an extraordinary artist, as well as a social commentator and activist, a father, a teacher, a mentor. We will hear from two people who knew him very well and from the exhibition's curator and my amazing colleague, Sarah Kelly Oler, who through her research and her writing has become deeply acquainted with White. I'll introduce Sarah and then she will introduce our um, terrific presenters as well. Sarah is the Field McCormick Chair and Curator of American Art at the Art Institute of Chicago. She's distinguished for her wonderful exhibitions, her scholarship, her leadership, and her ability to, con to connect with audiences. Her projects include, among many others, Whistler's Mother, an American icon returns to Chicago in 2017, she participated in America After the Fall, painting in the 1930s, in, which was presented in 2016, which explored the art and culture of the Depression era. Shatter, Rupture, Break, the modern series in 2015. And finally, They Seek a City, Chicago and Art of the Migration, 1910 to 1950, which was presented in 2013, and focus on immigrant and migrant artists in the city of Chicago. So without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Carrie James Marshall, Ian White, and Sarah Kelly Oler. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm so thrilled that you could all join us here tonight on what has been a torrentially rainy day. Um, so you are the brave and hardy souls who made it out, but I'm, I think we're in for a very special evening with our guests here tonight, uh, two men that have been so helpful and so wonderful in supporting this exhibition in their own ways. And so I will introduce both of them and then away we will go. Um, so I'll start with Ian White, who is an artist and teacher who lives in Los Angeles with his wife and son, and they're both in the audience here. Um, Ian is, of course, the son of Charles White and the executor of his estate. And in that regard, has been just tremendous support. He's let us roam archives. He's allowed us very graciously into his home many times um, in ways that I, I just can't thank him enough for. Um, and as an artist, his own visual practice, which includes paintings and sculpture among other media, was very much influenced by the community of artists that he grew up amongst, um, introduced to by his father. Now, Ian has recently authored and illustrated his very first children's book, which is about Charles White. It's called Grandpa in the Library, How Charles White Learned to Paint. And that has been published by the Museum of Modern Art on the occasion of this exhibition. So it is uh, hitting our shops, hopefully today or maybe tomorrow. Um, and then currently, Ian is working on curating an exhibition for uh, LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, called Life Model, Charles White and His Students. And this is a show that will be held at the Charles White Elementary School in Los Angeles. Um, this school is on the farmer site of the Otis Art Institute where uh, White taught for two decades and is in fact the only elementary school with a professional art gallery. So this is a, an exciting moment um, that will also be in conjunction with the presentation of Charles White a retrospective at LACMA in February of 2019. So Ian has been very busy in many arenas. Um, Turning now to Carrie, um, with a career, an amazing career that has spanned now uh, almost three decades. In some ways I feel like you don't need a lot of introduction, but I'm going to do so. Um, you're certainly best known for your extraordinary paintings depicting actual and imagined events from African American history. Um, you're, you know, that he is taking the subject matter of his paintings, his installations, his public projects from African American popular culture. And I think what's really extraordinary about his works is the range of art historical references that, that you um, bring to bear. Now, Kerry was born in Birmingham, Alabama, and educated, in fact, at the Otis Art Institute, where, of course, he studied with Charles White. Um, he received a BFA there in 1978 and, in fact, an honorary degree in 1999. Um, Carrie has exhibited widely now for many decades, um, but, of course, in 2016 and 17, the first major museum survey of his work occurred at uh, co-organized 
by the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles, the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And this survey, which was called Carrie James Marshall Mastery, I think was a revelation, a revelation for many people. Uh, Carrie works now and lives in Chicago. And again, like Ian, has been um, so crucial in this project. He has written the most beautiful and moving preface for our catalog and speaks very eloquently about the influence of white. And so it's just an absolute pleasure to have these two gentlemen here with us tonight for our conversation. So thank you and welcome. So I thought I would kick it off, um, to get in, you know, um, an initial conversation I had because I think it's such a special opportunity that we have um, having you both here as um, people who in many ways grew up with white, whether professionally and intellectually or actually with white as your father. And so I was hoping that... Um, we could just start off by talking a little bit. I have a few photos that I brought in. Um, just a little bit about Charles White as a man, you know, not elaborate, but just sort of a few words. What do you really think about when you start thinking about Charles White? Um, and we can just go from there. I don't know who wants to start, <laughs> but. <laughs> Well, Ian well, gets to talk about him as a dad. Okay, right, so right. that's a good place it, to start. It, Which is in some ways more than a man, more than yeah. just a man. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, Take it away then, Ian. I mean. Um, well, as a father, I was talking earlier about remembering sitting in this park here. Um, Grant this Park. Grant Park yeah. uh, with my father and watching people for hours just walk by and being able to visit Johnson Publication and going to this dedicated floor of Charles White's drawings that were for the shape, Lerone Bennett's Shaping of Black America. And I remember that being a very pivotal kind of moment, just in terms of, wow, look at this, all this work around, right? Just being impressed by that. But in terms of being a, you know, I've, I've lived and I've learned a great deal from my father's stu former students. And that's, uh, as I'm looking at this photograph of these youngsters and he's teaching, he's having a moment there. And it, it's, it's, I'm very fortunate to have this, this man right here who is a tremendous artist, um, regardless. Uh, and is such an advocate for Charles White. Um, usually don't get that. And that's kind of a unique position. Um, and I, you know, he has got this public format to speak of this man and his contribution. And we need more of that. I mean, there's other folks that contribute, but this is very gracious of Carrie and what he has done throughout the years. Um, you know, I'm a privileged child because being surrounded by creativity as a viable profession, uh, that's unique. And I'm very blessed to be in that kind of capacity. And you see these other kind of models. But, I mean, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, well, Carrie, you have a different well, perspective. Me, right, I, I do, yeah. but, but I'm sitting here, I'm just sort of uh, looking at these three photographs. Mm -hmm. And the, the funny thing in there to me, it's like he's, he's doing a presentation in a classroom. He's holding up pictures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's like, where was the slide projector back <laughs> in those days? It's like, there, yeah. there was a time, you know, there really was a time when you actually had to show the thing, you know, when you didn't just show pictures of stuff. And so that was, that was really funny. But, but Ian, so the, the, the one thing Ian hasn't said about how we know each other in a way, and it's more than just... Um, I mean, it, it, Charles White was special in a lot of ways. Definitely. And so, and he was special in, in, in this one particular way, uh, just because of the way in which Ian and I became really familiar with each other. Mm -hmm. So when Ian turned 10, Charles White asked me if I would take Ian and two of his friends for his birthday down to the Olympic Auditorium in Los Angeles to see some Lucha Libre. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Championship wrestling. <laughs> the 
the Guerrero <laughs> brothers. And the rest is history at this point. And the rest is history. I mean, that really was the first song. I had a, I had a 1960 Chevy Biscayne. It was big, it was green, it was like an airplane. It was wing tips. It was amazing. <laughs> So, but I had to drive all the way from Los Angeles to Pasadena to pick to, to, to where they lived at the top of a mountain <laughs> to pick them up and to take them back down to LA because the Olympic Auditorium was on Figueroa <laughs> and Grand. <clears throat> and I think so, and Charles, he gave me the money for the tickets mm -hmm. and $20 for some refreshments. <laughs> and they had the best time. The Fantastic. best time. It was unbelievable. So yeah, now we, yeah. I, had, now I hadn't even been to the Olympic Auditorium in person because we used to watch wrestling on TV. So there used to be wrestling and then there used to be the roller derby and they all, all, all took place at the Olympic Auditorium. But that's how I really uh, first got to know Ian. And somehow from that, from that one experience there, we just seemed to know each other from that point on. And so, and periodically, all the way through the rest of his life, as he was growing up, we just somehow stayed in touch. Uh, and I would go, I'd go to L.A. from time to time after I'd moved out to New York and then here to Chicago. And you know, people who were other students of, of Charlie's at Otis, Ulysses Jenkins and people like that, they would do things and Ian would be there. I would be there. So we would always reconnect uh, from time to time. Uh, and, but for me, I mean, what... I mean, that meant so much to me, partly because I respected that man as an artist so much and as a human being so much, but the fact that he entrusted his son at 10 years old with me <laughs> to take them out of t downtown, that, you know what, you don't know how special that is. <laughs> That's almost, I mean, it literally was almost like the king saying, you know, would you take the young prince? <laughs> <laughs> and Clearly you know, a show son. him a good time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it, that's how, but, that's, but that's how it felt to me. Mm -hmm. And it felt like, because when I was 10, again, was when I first heard about Charles White. I was 10 years old when I was in fifth grade. And that was from that book. And everybody, you've heard this story before. Everybody knows it. Tell it a little bit, you know, from give, give us a little bit of it, come on. <laughs> Not everyone has read your preface yet. So. No. But, this, but, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it was when we used to do book reports for Negro History Week back in the day. And there was, I did, there was a book called Great Negroes, Past and Present. And in it was a short biography of Charles White. No work, no reproductions, no photographs, none of that. But it was an image of him, and there was something about that image that got my attention. I don't know exactly what it was, but that got my attention. And from that moment on, his name was just in my head. Um, so that was when I was 10. And then when I was 13 or 14, I was given a, a summer drawing class at the Otis Art Institute that was taught by a man named George DeGroth, and he took the class down to the lecture hall and showed us images from a book called Images of Dignity, the Drawings of Charles White. Mm -hmm. Now, at the time, Charles White also had a studio on campus at Otis. And after we looked at those images on an opaque projector, no slides, <laughs> again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we looked at those pictures, and he, he said, well, you know, Charles White has a studio upstairs, and he said I could bring the class up to see what the studio looked like. And when I, I, the way I tell it, when I walked in, when that door opened, it was like going to the land of Oz. <laughs> because it's like you could see the magic. It was all right there in front of you. you know, and you could, what you could see was behind the scenes too. So you could see the beginnings of works, the works in the middle and work that was finished. And so you saw the whole process. You saw how it happened. And that, you, you, it's, it's, you can't even express how meaningful that understanding of the process is for an art, for somebody who aspires to be an artist. Because that, I mean, it doesn't erase the idea that you have to have some kind of talent. Mm -hmm. But what it does is give you some insight into the fact that you actually have to know something. Mm -hmm. And you have to that work. There are things that not only <laughs> that do you have to know something, but there are things you can learn and you can learn how to do that. And when you see work, like when you see the process, you see it in the studio, 
it just reveals to you exactly how it takes place. That is dedication, that is devotion, that is discipline, it's all those things and that constantly applying yourself to it leads to these kinds of things. And so in, after seeing those images and coming down from that studio, I was copying an image from the book, from the Images of Dignity book, a drawing of Frederick Douglass. I was making a copy of it in the classroom and Charles White walked into our room. Mm -hmm. That's when I first saw him as a living human being and I decided instantly at that moment that when I graduated from high school, I was gonna go to school at Otis. Mm -hmm. And everything I did from that moment to then, till I got there was to make sure I was able to get to that school. And I was only going to that school because he was there. I forego, forewent a scholarship to another art school because I wanted to be at Otis because Charles was there. I paid money to go somewhere where I could have gone somewhere and taken a drawing <laughs> class for free. <laughs> Because he meant, he meant that much. I mean, he really did mean that much. And in the pantheon of artists who had made work, there wasn't any, I hadn't seen anything by anybody that was as powerful or as magnificent as the work he was doing. And I wanted to be a part of that. And so that's sort of what he represented for me from the time I was 10, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was the period when I met Ian, until I became an adult and was able to get to Otis where I could then just sort of be there and then to be around him enough uh, for him to be comfortable enough with me, for him to be as interested in my development as he was to allow me to take his son out on, a, uh, on an evening. I mean, that's, it's like you, you, don't, you hardly even read about things like that in art history books. <laughs> right. I mean, it just doesn't happen like that for everybody. Well, and I, mean, I was fortunate enough for it to happen to me. Yeah, I mean, he was such an incredible mentor for you and such an incredible role model. I mean, and I mean, I think now both of you are artists or teachers. You know, have you really carried that spirit forward, would you say? I think you have, but, you know, I'd love to hear a few words on that. Sort of what have you taken from this, this aspect of him as this incredibly generous, trusting person who inspires people? Well, but you know what, the, what I took from it, from him as a teacher on the one thing, that if I know something and I have contact with students, they're gonna know it too. Mm -hmm. That I have an obligation to tell everything I know. <clears throat> because it's, it's not my, it's what I figured, it's not my decision that, it wasn't my decision as a professor or as a teacher to tell people what they should and shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. My responsibility was to give them everything that I knew so they can choose then to do whatever it was they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But they weren't gonna, they were gonna, if they left my class, they were gonna be equipped with at least the information and the methodology mm -hmm to be able to apply whatever it is they thought they wanted to apply to whatever it is they wanted to apply it to. I'm not one, I was never one of those people who thought that there were certain kinds of things that, certain kinds of knowledge that were obsolete, mm -hmm. there were things you didn't need to know, and there were skills you didn't have to have. That was never the way I approached it because he wasn't like that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and to the degree that that was the case, it was like he approached everything with integrity. Mm -hmm. There was integrity there. I mean, there were a lot of professors at Otis at the time who told people they didn't have to know anything. <laughs> who, when you went in for a crit, consisted of them sitting around talking about things they did when they were 25 years old. <laughs> <laughs> the people they hung out with at the bars, the people they went to the clubs with. That, that was all that uh, constituted education for some, of those, for some professors. That didn't work well for me because I thought it left you vulnerable to a kind of dismissal um, that I thought was really not pragmatic, mm -hmm. <laughs> certainly not advantageous, especially for black people who were trying to break into an art wor world that wasn't particularly interested in what you were in doing in the first place. Mm -hmm. I mean, so you would doubly handicap yourself by not knowing anything. <clears throat> oh, okay. 
Apparently I'm rustling. Oh. <laughs> oh. So, but anyway, but that's the thing. So it's like, so what is it, so if, if you, what is it we're trying to inspire people to do? And what I felt from Charlie when he was together, a part of what he was trying to prepare people to do is to exceed what he was able to achieve, to be able to go further than he was able to go. Mm -hmm. And so he, I just always felt like he made sure that if you left his company, you were equipped mm -hmm. to do what he could do and to do more than he did if you had to. Right. And certainly you have in many ways. I mean, you've sort of advanced his cause, I think, in, in a lot of ways. I mean, I would, we haven't really actually discussed White's work too much yet, but I mean, I would, be, I would love to sort of hear your opinions about what's really lasting in his work. What works still move you? And we have a few slides, we can go through them, but really I, I'm sort of curious about, you know, when you look at now his career, what what really stands out as the most significant lasting element of it? Well, That's a huge I, I, question, I know. <laughs> yeah, but I actually, I want to just stay here just okay. for a second. Sure, absolutely. Because I think part of it really is not only being this practitioner um, and really understanding history and understanding the history of your craft, mm -hmm. um, but in turn teaching and, and sharing that information because it's not privileged. Mm -hmm. And to really get that out. Um, it's not about, well, I'm better than you. It's about, you know, you can elevate your game, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but the rigor that's involved is a very, you know, hard discipline. Studio practice is a very, you know, is challenged by young folk mm -hmm. um, to carve out this time. This is the hardest working painter I know. Mm -hmm. um, and the dedication that is required for that to occur, a lot of people aren't willing to do um, because it, you sacrifice a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, for younger folks you, in, in college, it's social. You're gonna lose your social time. But if you really believe in what you're doing, then that can be picked up and that is, you, that is grown throughout your kind of time. Um, and to really get involved in your work and understanding what you're trying to do, your own personal history, those things are not easy challenges. Mm -hmm. So that's, but, well, but you also have to keep in, I mean, if you keep in mind, and we'll, we'll talk about the work later, I mean, he was clearly going against the grain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, in 1977, when I arrived at Otis, the last thing anybody would have suggested you should do was to make drawings mm -hmm. and pictures, especially from a figure. Mm -hmm. That's the last thing. So, uh, I mean, that was a dynamic period right. when conceptual artists had almost completely taken over at the academy. And Otis wasn't any different than any other place, mm -hmm. really. Um, but the, what made the moment so exciting was that there seemed to be something at stake. Um, I mean, you had to really mount a vigorous defense of anything you wanted to do because there was more than enough people there to cut you, on, cut you off at the knees if you didn't know what you were talking about. Um, I mean, it had gotten so bad. I mean, uh, Charles, he was, lucky to, he was lucky to be there because, <laughs> I mean, the people who were, who were teaching him what they called intermediate at the time were really trying to get those people fired. They wanted to cut out figure drawing, painting, sculpture. They wanted to cut all that stuff out. Um, so, I mean, the fact that he was still there and that his drawing classes were as popular as they were still, I mean, is a testament, I think, to the integrity of the work he was, he was trying, to, uh, trying to produce. Mm -hmm. Now, it's hard to sustain a level of, of energy and expertise in just about anything you're doing. I mean, hardly anybody is able to do it mm -hmm. and to do it really well. Um, but I, I, I happened to uh, arrive at Otis at what I think on some level is probably the sweet spot in Charles White's 
career. So that period from 1967, 68 through 1971, 72, I think those, and you'll see some of the work from the slides I think you took. Yeah. I think that was really this, the sweet spot where he hit, he hit a kind of a, a moment in which the, the structural integrity of the work, the technical virtuosity of the execution, the symbolic resonance in the work, that all of those things sort of hit, were hitting on all cylinders during that period. Mm -hmm. um, but you can see, if you trace it back to the early work he was doing in the 40s, you can see how it all sort of emerged, how, where it came from. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wasn't jumping from one thing to another thing. There's an evolution that's clear in the work that leads to a moment in which he said, boom, it sort of all just hits. Um, and then, I mean, what I hadn't realized until I was reading through the, the material before I was writing that preface was that, I mean, Charles White, he, he only lived to be 61. He, he was 61 years old when he died. And that was just, that was shocking to me mm -hmm. to, to realize that. Um, because, you, and, and, and in that last year, he was, he was struggling a little bit. I mean, it was kind of... Uh, fragile, you know, kind of frail. Um, but it's, it's like, I mean, can you, if, if, he, if he had maintained his health, if he had been able to, to, mm -hmm. to go on, I mean, who knows? Where would he have gone next? Yeah. yeah. If he would have made the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> Multiculturalism, right? Yeah. <laughs> hmm. So do you have favorite works, either of you, that you would talk about? I mean, again, I'm sort of love to come back to the, the work itself. Like, what makes it so exceptional? Is it just the artistry? I mean, is it the ideas and the artistry together? I think we all have our opinions, but... Um. Yeah, it's, those, it's all those things together. Mm -hmm. I mean, but one of the things you, you have to... I think you can recognize in, in Charles White's work is that People speak about the work as being narrative, mm -hmm. but I don't think the work ever really was fully narrative work. I mean, I, it was, the work was always emblematic. Mm -hmm. um, it was always about presence. It's like the black subject as a presence in the picture. And that presence was then supported by the kind of virtuosity he, he deployed in the execution of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there was a straightforwardness to what he was doing because he was never really, I mean, it's almost, I mean, after a certain point, I mean, after that early kind of Cubist inflected period, I mean, there's almost no distortion in any of that work at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's some mannerisms that occur like those oversized arms and hands and stuff sometimes. But other than that, I mean, there's really no, distortion. I mean, he was never about making black monstros black people into monstrosities. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was always about preserving a certain kind of, I mean, that title, Image of the Dignity, I think means something. Um, because I think he, he understood a little bit about what the image was up against. Mm -hmm. uh, and not being one to contribute to any sort of sense of degradation at all, I think he just went all in for, for the most mac magnificent sort of presence he could construct. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and you can, you clearly see that those, like there's nobody else who makes a drawing that looks like a Charles White drawing. So they're stylized figures. I mean, they're not really photorealistic figures, although they appear to be, but they're mm -hmm. stylized figures because he had a certain way of constructing faces and, and heads and things. Uh, mm -hmm. But it's, it's all of those things together. And when you, you walk into the when you see some of those those works where I mean it's like there's no beginning and no end to it mm -hmm. you know it's just complete there's a kind of totality uh, that envelops the figure that's represented there I mean it's a kind of totalizing uh, effect and that by itself that's that's what everybody's trying to get at, mm -hmm. you know. And I see, and I don't see much difference. I don't see any difference really between that and a Jackson Pollock painting. Mm -hmm. That kind of all overness. There's a kind of all overness in the way Charles White deploys his techniques too. It just happens to be a more, a more, uh, more explicit kind of imagery in it. But it still has the same kind of completeness that the best of the Jackson Pollock works has. Mm -hmm. It's not a whole lot different than a Barnett Newman painting. It's not that different really. 
because it's the way in which the figure and those marks occupy the space of that plane of the mm -hmm. drawing. That matters in uh, Charles White's work. Uh, and you, and you, when you read re work that's really successful, you have you take all of those things as a kind of harmony, mm -hmm. you know, um, and that's what generates the, the 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 impact that the work has. Now, there's a, a I don't know if you had that drawing, Seed of Love. Uh, I don't didn't bring that slide, but the, sorry. In the, oh. <laughs> But it's in the show, so you can go see it. <laughs> <laughs> you can, yeah. but I, so I remember the, the first time I walked into the LA County Art Museum and I saw that drawing from across the room. Mm -hmm. You know, it was magnetic. Mm -hmm. It's just magnetic. Um, because I had, so in 1971, there was an exhibition at the LA County Art Museum called Three Graphic Artists. Mm -hmm. Now that was the first time the LA County Art Museum had ever had an exhibition of work by black artists in the museum. It was Charles White, David Hammonds, and Timothy Washington. Mm -hmm. Three graphic artists. It wasn't even in the museum. <laughs> it was in the art <laughs> rental gallery down <laughs> around the back. <laughs> it's, um, it's true. But that show, <laughs> I mean that show, I went to see that show. I, I can't tell you how many times I went to see that show. But that was where David Hammonds, it's like nobody knew who David Hammonds was before then. Mm -hmm. nobody. And they picketed that show, just for your reference, because a lot of people were displeased that it wasn't in a, in a major gallery room. That That's it was, part of that art rental gallery thing bothered into some this people. kind of alternative <laughs> space. Um, and that was a point of contention for many folks who felt that not only was it, it should have just been focused on Charles White, but Charles White, again, would bring in these students. And that speaks again to what we were talking about, that kind of relationship. You don't really distinguish uh, your, yourself and just go into the, the I individual kind of thing. You bring in folks, you bring folks with you. It's part Absolutely. of the, the collective kind of consciousness. Um, and so, I mean, to that point, mm -hmm. though, I mean, I, when I, I had a, a, an exhibition in 2005 that was supposed to be the first survey at the MCA. And for, my, for that show, I did the same thing. So a lot of people are talking. So you brought about, some younger. Well, I brought two young artists who would never have been asked to show at the MCA. I had them have a section in my show. And then I brought Sangha Mengudi mm -hmm. to be in my show also. And now Sangha, a lot of people, are, uh, she has sort of become present again mm -hmm. in the art world in a way that for a long time she had been uh, unrecognized. But I, I, I had work of hers and I asked, I, I had classic work of hers and then I asked her to do a new installation for the show. So I brought those works together for the first for the opening of my show when it was at the MCA. And then I did that for every venue that the show traveled to. And at the last venue, when the show was in Birmingham, where I was born, so it was a kind of a homecoming at the Birmingham Museum, I then brought the work of people who were teachers and mentors of mine, and I put them in the show. And I showed a drawing, a work of Charles that's now in the collection at the Museum of Modern Art that nobody had ever really asked about. Black Pope. Black Pope. The Black Pope that I sandwich have. board man. Mm -hmm. I called Ian. I said, Ian, do you know where that drawing is? <laughs> that painting is? <laughs> Can I get it? <laughs> Definitely. And he made it happen. And then that work ended up now, what's about eight years later, ends up in the collection at the Museum of Modern Art. Right. Mm -hmm. That we just did something in October with this juxtaposition of the Black Pope and a Da Vinci drawing. Uh, that was quite something. Right, but it was, a, it was a way in which this, you sort of extend the kind of generosity that Charles White extends to other artists by bringing them in to participate in a show with him. You, 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 got it, you keep that, you keep doing it, because mm -hmm. that's really what it's about. I mean, it really is about cultivating another generation of people. And not only did I have Charles White in, I had Carol Walker's father show a work in my show too, Larry Walker. 
But that's the thing. It's like we are, the, the great thing about being at Otis was that you, you arrive on that campus and you find out you're a part of a community of makers mm -hmm. that extends all the way back to the founding principles of art history. You know, and it's like being a part of that club where everybody's trying to be at the top of their game. Um, and you, you, you go for broke. I mean, you're really going all, you're all in. I mean, that's just, I can't think of much that was, I, I can't think of much that's more interesting and exciting to be a part of than that. Mm -hmm. Like to be in a thing and that you, you're operating at the top of your game, you're standing next to somebody who's at the top of their game. It's like, that's just... That's Creative nothing, competition. There's nothing like it. Mm -hmm. no. Out of curiosity, would you have been a figurative artist had you not worked with White? Like, were you already on that path from the minute you were 10 years old and seeing his work in a, in a book? You know, like how, how formative has the fact that he was a figurative artist been for you? Because it's, as you say, very much going against the grain. Yeah, but you know what? The, the, the fact that he was a figurative artist was less the issue. Mm -hmm. The issue was that that work was powerful and great with figures. Mm -hmm. I was trying to be... Well, th let me put it this way. This is the way, I, the way I look at the art, at, at what it means to be an artist and to be in the art world. So if you take, I was born in 1955. <clears throat> and if you go to the library and you look through art history books, you get to look at work that has been collected, analyzed, and sorted from let's just be conservatively, from 4,000 years ago all the way up to the present. So when I go to the library, that's what I get to look at. And I get to look at work that's from every part of the planet. So I can look at Chinese work, I can look at Korean work, I can look at Japanese work, I can look at Native American art, I can look at Eskimo work. I get to see all of that because I was born in 1955 and all that information had been compiled and analyzed and had been assembled and made available to me. So my scope of what it means to be an artist encompasses all that. Mm -hmm. And if what it means to be an artist, as I learned from Charles White, is that you have to know something, you know something not only about yourself and your own history, but about the history of the world and about the history of the ways in which people have made those kinds of things, that's what I wanted to be a part of. I wanted to be a part of the, the grand picture of what it meant to be an artist, which means I can look at Egyptian work, I can look at Sumerian work, I can look at Greek work, I can look at all of that stuff. It's all the same stuff. So mm -hmm. in 1955, also you have to remember, <laughs> uh, Morris, well, Barnett Newman had already done you know, who's afraid of red, yellow, and blue? Right. I think by, by 1955. Jackson Pollock was finished <laughs> long before then. <laughs> um, Morris Lewis was pouring paint. Mm -hmm. You know, Ellsworth Kelly was doing his thing. Mondrian had already done his stuff. Picasso had already done. All those things had already been done. Mm -hmm. So the scope of what's available to me now means that I get to kind of pick from this menu of incredible things and ideas. And I can be any of those or any combination of those synthesized together. That was my, that's how I started out mm -hmm. wanting to be an artist, was taking into account all of that other stuff too. Mm -hmm. So the freedom. And so the freedom to do whatever you want to do is the modernist condition. Mm -hmm. That to me, modernism isn't what a picture looks like. It's not whether it's abstract or figurative. It's whether you made a choice to do one thing as opposed to another thing, given the range of choices that are available to you. That's what modernism is. 
And so I could do the figure. Mm -hmm. And I tried at 15 to make original work in the style of Charles White. I tried to do that. And I tried to do that partially because Leonardo da Vinci said I should. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing. So what does Leonardo da Vinci say? He said, when you, for a young artists, find yourself a good master and copy what they do because it will train your hand to good form. So I did that in Charles White. I used him to do it. So the idea of it, though, is something that somebody said 500 years ago. <laughs> right. So that's... And so when I encountered that, encountered Charles White, and then I encountered Barnett Newman, well, it's all the same to me. Mm -hmm. I don't see where that's, I don't see where one of those things is different or one of them is more privileged than the other one. Given what they were trying to do at the moment that they did it, those things were meaningful in a time, in a time mm -hmm. at a place. So it's, that's, so, and since on some level, representation is the very foundation of what it means to make art in the first place. And my thing was that if you master representation, then you are free to then go on to do anything you want to do. But if you can't do that, if you don't master the dynamics of that, and I don't mean simple representation, because there are a lot of people who can just make a picture. <laughs> it's not that remarkable. But it's how you, imply, how you apply it the accumulated knowledge that's available to you from the historical record to the images you make, that's what matters the most, mm -hmm. you know. How do you apply that? Um, because I don't, as I said earlier, I don't believe you jettison any of that information that was available to you before because some other thing seems more accessible in the moment that you live. That's just, that's, to me, that's cheap. Right. It's all there. It's all part of the backdrop. It's all the tapestry of what you're doing. Yeah. I don't know. I enjoy listening to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there, there used to be a phrase people used to say, go for what you know. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's it. Go for what you but know. But you better know something. Right. You better know something. <laughs> <laughs> But you've definitely focused on African American history, as did Charles White, um, you know, and that's to me such a a crucial element of his work was making visible a knowledge um, that he felt was was missing at the time, um, certainly missing from his own education and you know very much sort of self educated. Um, and you've likewise chosen some of these similar themes, maybe not identical, but mm -hmm. um, can you speak sort of for you about the importance of, of acting as a, a visual historian of sorts? You know, not, as you say, maybe narrative, but sort of conveying some of the, the complexity of, of historical um, storytelling or, you know, whether it's through art historical references or the story, the, the narrative itself. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I know what you, I know what you mean. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you you gotta you you come at making art from where you are. I mean, mm -hmm. from from our moment, and I mean, there's a there's a certain there's a certain level of self respect that. Mm -hmm. uh, that drives the choices you make. And so if, if, you are, if you find yourself in a place or in a position where you are only able to acknowledge the beauty and the magnificence of other people, mm -hmm. uh, at a certain point, you're gonna reach a crisis <laughs> of self-respect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a part of, I mean, and you, you I will acknowledge that a part of the choice to do figures and to do black figures in particular and to focus on black history and culture in particular, uh, a, that there is a certain mission mm -hmm. um, associated with doing work like that. Um, because on some level, you got to, I mean, if, if, if you recognize that everything, so the Art Institute as a museum upstairs, 
I mean, if you come to the museum and you say, man, there's some great shit in here. (laughs) (laughs) There really is. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We would agree. (laughs) Then at some point you have to say, I want to be in here too. Mm -hmm. I want to be in here too. And what are the terms under which I want to be in here? Do I want to be in here anonymously or do I want to come with everything blame, bla- with the guns blazing all barrels, mm-hmm. you know? And to me, <laughs> <laughs> because Picasso is in here, mm-hmm. he's not compromising. Right. Matisse is in here, he's not compromising. Everybody else who's up in there, they're in there with whoever they are, mm-hmm. all the dimensions of it. And so you, at some point you have to match that in terms of availability, meaning you have to figure out how to make sure there are as many black figures in the museum as there are white figures. Mm-hmm. You got to, you yeah. just have to. Yeah. Uh-huh. Because it's the only way you would start, it's the only way you would recognize that you belong there too, and it's the only way you would recognize that you're as equal as everybody else in mm-hmm. terms of capability and in terms of uh, uh, the appealing nature of the work. Yeah. You gotta be in there too. So you can't keep coming in complaining about the fact that you don't see yourself. Hmm. You gotta come in here and put yourself in there. Mm-hmm. And then you gotta know how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> But that's the thing. And so it's like if he didn't do figures, mm-hmm. we wouldn't have these figures to talk about. Right. I wouldn't have had those figures to emulate. I wouldn't have had those as a model. I would only have Michelangelo as a model. Pretty now Michelangelo, he's a, he's a great model, but at some, but yeah. you know. <laughs> 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 yeah. I don't only want to have, yeah. that's the thing. I don't only want to believe, I, I don't only want to be able to believe that that's the kind of image that belongs in a place like that. Mm-hmm. That's, it, it's as simple as that, mm-hmm. really. It's that simple. Right. And that's why, so, uh, why I say it, 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 it has, it doesn't, it has nothing to do with whether or not, the success of work has nothing to do with whether it's abstract or figurative. That's not what the term, because there's a lot of bad abstract art. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of bad conceptual art. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's not it. It's how you deploy those strategies to achieve a particular thing. And you have to know what that particular thing is every time you set out to make a thing, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I'm always struck. I mean, I think so much of what you're talking about with museums and which is clearly you know a, a sort of issue that museums are still struggling with so tremendously um and it's one that when i look at white's career i'm constantly so impressed at how dedicated he was to getting his works out wherever they could be you know whether it was through reproductions whether it was through museum exhibitions which he exhibited a lot you know he's exhibiting at the whitney at the met in the 50s um then he, of course you know they start ignoring him again but um but ultimately <laughs> well, that's an interesting story about that yeah but um but ultimately you know he's really dedicated to making sure his works are visible and that's you know it's part of his power is in the works but the power is also in his his mission, as you say, to ensure that people see them. And that seems to be so important, both in sort of his work as a teacher. I know that you've talked about sort of um, seeing his works in the community and how that important that was. Um, well, the portfolios were very important mm-hmm. to get, because of the, the, the idea that these are individual works and, and they may be housed in an institution or in a home. And how do you get that em- image out? And again, taking the preciousness out of it on a certain level right. and making it available to folks to buy a portfolio for $10. Um, and then people in turn framing those works and putting these recognizable imagery that spoke of their experience, their families on the wall and embracing that. And not only that, I mean, there's, there's multiple things that happen. 
because a lot of his work is used in different publications and periodicals. And then it's taken again and put on just walls, on lampposts, on all kind of things that you wouldn't typically think you would see or find artwork. Um, but again, it goes back to that having this recognizable imagery for folks that are not represented. Mm -hmm. Um, that's huge. And doing it in a way that's figurative, that's realist, that's not abstract, that's not, you know, ethnograph, it's not, you know, stereotypical version of that experience, right. so to speak, um, is very, is, is, is incredibly, uh, when, when I used to, I lived in New York for a minute in the, in the 80s, and this is the David Dinkin years, and you could walk the streets and buy books on the street. It was amazing. I loved it. And, but I could always find a reproduction of my father's framed <laughs> that some cat had who was just selling for 10 or $20. Mm -hmm. and, and just the, the idea of that being precious, that image, and putting it back out there for circulation. And working with, in terms of this exhibition that we're doing on my father's former students, a lot of their recognition and understanding and first introduction is through images of dignity, mm -hmm. but it's also just random posters that they would find, calendars. The Golden State Mutual the Life Golden Insurance State Company calendar. <laughs> That's yeah. right, that you actually see in the retrospective here. Yeah. Now, when I was, uh, I was in elementary school, we went on field trips to the Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company in L.A., Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which had a great art collection. Yeah, it sure did. And they owned that Harriet Tubman uh, uh, drawing that's up there, and I actually saw it hanging in the office when I went on that field trip. There uh, is. That drawing. That one right I have. That was it. <laughs> <laughs> but the, but the, the, everything Ian was saying was true. I mean, the way the work was disseminated through Ebony Magazine, through Golden State Mutual's Life Insurance Company's calendar, those things are all really important in terms of the way the work sort of found the place within the culture. Mm -hmm. And the community. And the community. Um, but it's, but we, I, I know that Charles White would have wanted to be represented in the high places too. Mm -hmm. Totally, and completely. So, that, so this is the yeah. thing, it's like, that's one, that's one kind of success. And it's, it's, it's actually the model, this, the, the model that Afro-Cobra which was founded here in Chicago, mm -hmm. started. The reason why they did a lot of print works was to make the work more available to more people so that it didn't always, you didn't always have to assume that only rich people bought artworks. Mm -hmm. But there's something about also having the work sort of reach these sort of temples of mm -hmm. high culture that matters. Completely. Oh. And to be able to, and the thing is to, 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 to know or to believe that there is something that you can do to make sure your work gets to those places and not, it's not just a random sort of stroke of luck where you're sitting on your, sitting in, in your garret by the cold stove <laughs> <laughs> waiting for somebody right. to knock on your door and say, come, you know, come, come on, on over here. You got to, my thing was, oh, you got to have some, you got to, you got to know that you have a better than 50, 50 chance mm -hmm. of getting in there. Otherwise, I don't know why you would keep on doing it because it's like, it's the difference between, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of Cubs baseball on the radio nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and you're like, these guys, you know, <laughs> it's like the number of times they're talking about sending somebody back down to the minors. <laughs> now, that's a demotion. <laughs> that's a demotion. <laughs> nobody wants to stay in, nobody wants to go back to the minors, nobody wants to be in the minors. You want to be called up from the minors. Mm -hmm. But, the re but if you think about the reasons why they make those moves, I mean, if you listen to the way people talk about the analytics of how some pitcher pitches his pitches and the range of pitches they have available to them and stuff like that, I mean, come on. <laughs> if you don't have that range, they're not picking you. And if you can't sustain that, so nowadays the pitchers can't pitch past 100 pitches in a game, they start falling apart. So they don't get past the fifth inning most of the time. Well... 
I mean, would you want to be known as the person they paid, like, well, now you Darvish is on the hot seat. <laughs> they pay you all that money, you can't get past the third inning. <laughs> so everybody's talking about you bad. <laughs> but what do they do? They put him on injured reserve and they try to coach him out of the problems they see him having. So obviously there must be something you can do. It's not just luck. It's not just talent. You're not just born with it. There are things you have to know. There are things you have to put into practice. And those things can guarantee that you get into a particular place or not. Now, if you're trying to be in the NBA, you can go overseas and play in Turkey. <laughs> you can do that. <laughs> but you're never going to be on an NBA championship team if that's where you end up. And if you want to be on an NBA team, there are certain things you have to kind of do. You have to be able to do. So, so I don't know why I'm saying that. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it comes. But <laughs> no, but I, 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 I think you know the, the the crucial point you're raising is sort of this knowledge of the art world extends past right. the actual mastery that one can convey and into a sort of finessing. And I and I do think I mean White was prolific. Your father was prolific in exhibiting all the time. Like he knew in some ways how to play the game. Now it took museums a couple decades to catch up with the game he was playing, but not all. I mean, you know, there was again um, some early uh, hitters, but, um, but ultimately I do think that he had this sort of savvy. So it's talent, but it is you know, well, see, how that, to get there. But this raises an interesting point because the savvy this you're talking about, it cuts both ways. Mm -hmm. So why, so in, in the book they published on the Black Pope sandwich board man at the Museum of Modern Art. Which by the way, I can finally get to. That's the, the drawing. There it is. That's it. So that's the first major work of Charles White, the Museum of Modern Art ever acquired. Mm -hmm. But in that book, there's a photograph of Charles White and Elizabeth Catlett having lunch with Alfred Barr, the museum's director, and the chief curator uh, at the time, whose name I can't uh, oh. quite recall. It was Dorothy Miller, wasn't it? Dorothy yeah. Miller. Mm -hmm. That photograph was taken in 1945. Mm -hmm. And in the book, uh, Esther Adler writes in the preface about this rapport between Dorothy Miller and Charles White that seems evident in that photograph. So that's 1945. Mm -hmm. Museum of Modern Art acquired their first work, a print by Charles White in 1971. Mm -hmm. So what about that rapport? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so, but what does that represent? So, and I said, this was eight years after the Museum of Modern Art had had an exhibition of William Edmondson, the first black person to have a solo show at the Museum of Modern Art. 1937. In 1937. Mm -hmm. Why? Why, then, why him and not Charles White? It's because William Edmondson is an unschooled, untrained mm -hmm. artist who made, carved uh, gra gravestones that have a kind of naive, primitivist kind of look to it. And the reason why Edmondson was having a show there and not Charles White, is because Charles White is not reflect this sort of primitivist idea mm -hmm. that modernist curators and museum people had of what black people was supposed to be. Yep, absolutely. They wanted black people who seemed unspoiled, mm -hmm. uneducated, and uncontaminated by civilization. Right, Horace Pippin. <laughs> <laughs> That's the idea of black people they wanted to project. That's why Charles White's work wasn't in the Museum of Modern oh, Art definitely. in 1945. <laughs> yeah. No, it's true. I mean, so, it, there's so much institutional. Right. But there were a lot of like, black, some black artists who went the primitive his way because they wanted to be, a, they wanted to get in there. He didn't go that way. He didn't go that way. 
But that's the thing. So there, there are these ideas about what black people are supposed to be and what they're supposed to be able to do and the kinds of things you want to see black people do. Those things find their way in the museum first. This kind of stuff by Charles White has a much harder way to go because it doesn't confirm, conform to those ideas about what black people are mm -hmm. and where their creativity lies, you know, whether they're intellectuals or whether they're somehow working off some kind of instincts, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> That's the difference. The whole foundation of modernism was built on this principle that there are these people out there in the world who are not, not affected by the alienating effects of industrialization and modernization. They're closer to the way we used to be as cavemen. <laughs> I mean, to put it crudely. <laughs> They're closer to that. Uh, we want to get a little bit of that because we lost it because we got all these machines and right. stuff. Yeah, this sort of authenticity. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, so so I, in a way, but that answers, the, that, yeah. that in part answers the question of why Charles White's work took so long to find its way into the museum, because mm -hmm. he didn't conform to any of those sort of stere stereotypes of what people wanted black people to be like. Mm -hmm. um, so, but the thing is like, there's a way in which you can look at works like this and you say, if that's not a masterful representation a masterful use of material, the drawing structure, all of that. If that's not what that is, then I don't know what you can call it. Mm -hmm. And in the museums, the way I see it, it's like when you see something that is that powerful, then that deserves to be in the museum too. It just deserves to be there because it's powerful. Um, and that's, that sort of answers the question of how you deal with the way in which certain artists, because a lot of people make figures. Nobody makes black figures as powerful as Charles White's. Nobody. And so why not? Let people experience the magnificence of that drawing on its own terms, independent of what you might want to, where you might want to shoehorn it into a sort of period, sort of uh, where one mode of <laughs> working seems more dominant than another. That thing by itself is always going to be as good as it is all the time. Mm -hmm. So I want to see that too, and I think other people should see it as well. So why not, why aren't museums sort of built around that too? You know, rather than sort of uh, building these sort of period rooms where everything else that was made in 19... 72, if it doesn't look like this, can't be in there. <laughs> so, anyway. So, I, th yeah. <laughs> I think on that note, we can end. <laughs> so, uh, we're pretty much out of time. <laughs> but I mean, I think, you know, to, you raise crucial questions, ones that we continue to grapple with, that we know that we have to grapple with. And I think it takes people like you sort of constantly holding us to account. So thank you for that. Um, bring it on. <laughs> anyway. Um, Want to add anything? Yeah. Let me just say this one thing. <laughs> because I don't think I... Don't think I well, I mean, and the, the, the one thing, so, but if you take a, it, it just sort of follows up on what I just finished saying, though. I mean, that, it's like good drawing is good drawing. Mm -hmm. Good painting is good painting. And it's like, because there's a black figure in that doesn't mean that figure is only interesting to black people mm -hmm. as a drawing. It can't be. Because if that was the case, then I couldn't possibly be interested in Leonardo da Vinci. Mm -hmm. I couldn't possibly. I couldn't recognize that there's anything good about that. I couldn't recognize that there was anything good about Tiepolo or anything. If, mm -hmm. if, 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 if I only had to see images that had people in it that looked like me and I could only respond to those, then... That's its own limit. That's its own kind of limitation. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the fact that there's a black figure in there doesn't undermine the magnificence of the drawing mm -hmm. in any way at all. It, the, the magnificence is an invitation to be engaged with the thing. Um, and that's just the way, uh, that's, that's, I think that's what museums are for, mm -hmm. really.
It's to give people an opportunity to engage with things that are magnificently done. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>